Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter, and I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at CollectiveCon that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now, and I'll see you at CollectiveCon, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show in this episode of The Short Box. There's a little bit of pressure, guys. There is. Not just, like, that it's Vampirella, but I want this to potentially show that there's room for podcasts and YouTubers that talk about comics to have opportunities to collaborate here and there on a fun project. You know, we have to maintain, like, at arm's length sometimes the stuff that we're reviewing and stuff like that, but that doesn't mean that we can't have friendly relationships with some of these people. And I want it to do well. That's all self-imposed. But yeah, I've put some pressure on myself that I want this to be successful so that there's potential other opportunities for other people. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Short Box Podcast. The Short Box Podcast is recorded live from Jacksonville, Florida. Yo, Short Box Nation, welcome back to the podcast. I hope you're feeling good. I hope you're feeling great. And most importantly, I hope you're ready to hear yet another great conversation about comics. If you're new to the show, welcome. This is the Short Box Podcast, the comic book talk show that brings you the best conversations about comic books and the pop culture inspired by them. My name is Bodder, and this is episode 385. And if you're watching the video version of uh, today's podcast, look, it's no secret. I'm not here alone. I've heard your pleas. I've heard the feedback. Oh, I've heard the comes. outcry. All right. I've, I've heard all of you saying, oh, okay. Botter, it's been a month. Where is everybody? Botter, we get it. You love hosting the show, but you can't carry it on your own, man. Where is everybody? And you're all correct. All right. It's been way too long since I've shared the mic with any of my talented friends. That's the truth. And that's why today I called in the big guns, goddammit, and dragged your favorite co host. Away from his loving family, his newborn daughter, <laughs> yes. I told him to say goodbye to his little baby girl. You did. And I forced him out of paternity leave. Not paid, by the way. Hold on a second. It's not paid. Ladies and gents, let's give it up for the return of Cesar Cordero. Okay. Silly. I'm You're so silly. excited. You know that, you. right? I'm so excited. It's to see ridiculous. You. Let's cherish the, the, the moment that we do have okay. together. You know, right? you're not Howard Stern. You know that, right? <laughs> You're sitting here, like, got these canned everything. Like, Robin, bring in the Boogerita. What's going on with that? Oh, my God. Is that coming where I think it's coming from? Get out of here, dude. Bit of my nail in it? I mean, you, I all right, a little bit, a little, right, little bit. Thank you so much. All right, moving along. Today, we are joined by someone who has dedicated the last six plus years of his life to being a champion of comics. Yeah. His name is Chris Pierce, and he runs the very popular comic YouTube channel, Comic Tropes. Mm. Which, if I'm being honest, was the only reason Cesar is here today. All right. <laughs> I was like, see, I'd love to have you on the show. You're like, ah. No, you but know what's at funny? At the mere mention of Chris and comic oh, tropes. Hold on, hold on. So and I, I also like, up. I also shoulder checked you a little bit. Like, I was like, bro, you say you're a fan, but like, how far back do you go as far as fandom is concerned? Which theme song did you jump in on? Don't even try and like, fern on me right now, okay? <laughs> 
You're right. C made sure to check my nerd card pretty hard, but he's here with us today. And so is our special guest, like I said, Chris Pierce from Comic Tropes. Yeah. Which, if you're unfamiliar, it is a comic channel that reviews the techniques and history of a wide variety of comic book creators and creators and characters. He's on the show today to talk about that and his recent comic campaign in collaboration with Dynamite Entertainment for his first comic cover ever. That's right. Aside from being a very popular comic YouTuber, he's also a very talented artist as well. True story. I think hashtag goals would be appropriate. I know, right? right? Here, right? So I'll formally introduce him here in a second, or you could just fast forward. So one of the timestamps I have listed in the show notes, if you want to skip all this opening ceremony stuff going on. <laughs> he's sitting there like, what the? But we got bills to pay. All right. We got bills to pay. And before we bring on our guest of honor, I got to give a big shout out to our incredible sponsor, Gotham City Limit. It's Jacksonville's premier location for comic books, collectibles, and toys. You'll hear from them uh, later on in this episode. And of course, there's the obligatory shout out to our friends and loyal supporters that make up our Patreon community. Give us your money. We love every single one of you. Most of you have already given us some of your money. And we appreciate you for helping us keep the light on if you're someone that's you know still on the fence about becoming a member of our why? patreon why why are you on the fence i ask that every day see <laughs> you're doing yourself a giant disservice i encourage you to sign up for things like bonus shows behind the scenes videos and first dibs on all of our content over on patreon.com slash the short box it'll be the i guarantee you it'll be the best two or five dollars that you spend depending on the tier you sign up it'll be the best money you spend on entertainment i highly encourage you to sign up for at least a month especially this month all right we got a lot of bonus stuff dropping i still got a bunch of interviews from collective con that hasn't seen the light of day yet and we'll be dropping those on our patreon and i've got some episode polls that i would love for you to vote on oh yeah so sign up for a month see if you like what we have to offer you will i guarantee it and thanks again to everyone supporting us already with all the shameless plugs out the way, let's go ahead and set the table for our esteemed guest today. It goes without saying, this man has done some great work that we both admire, whether it's deep diving into the history of Marvel and DC, or picking the brains of some of the best creative teams in comics. He's put real blood, sweat, and tears into this artistic medium that we all love and share, and he was a real deal, real life superhero, which might be the ultimate flex for any longtime comic fan. We'll talk about that more later on. With over 500 plus videos of comic analysis under his belt, it goes without saying he's a true bastion of comic culture and the perfect representative for what it has to offer the world. I feel like we need like some wrestling intro music, man. Like, was pretty, that's, I'm proud of you, bro. That's pretty good. I appreciate it. You know what? Speaking of Robert wrestling, you know, I'm going to go ahead and give our, our guest of honor a, a, a different. I'm okay. not going to give him the normal round of applause that I give everyone else. I'm going to give him something special. Shortbox Nation, without further ado, let's welcome Chris Piers to the show. Thank you, guys. If you're playing applause, I don't hear it on my end, but I I trust you. I trust you that there is applause. Dang, Chris, I'm telling you, it's it's raving applause, and I gave you a little intro, all right? No, you gave me, like, way too big of an intro. That was, like, the most, like... uh, you you just waxed my car. That was that was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot to live up to. That that set the expectations like really really high, and now I've got to like fulfill that. You'll come to realize that our standards are ridiculously low, and and you'll be just fine on this show. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you, C. I've never heard that phrase. You've waxed my car, but I will be I using just, that. I guess I just made it up. I don't That's know. good. He's got, that was good. He, he is like a wrestler. He's got catchphrases. Yeah, Chris. Welcome to the show. Yeah, but this is a, a a big moment for us. It. I understand that you are living in Seattle, right? You're in Seattle, the Seattle area. Yeah, just a little south of it, but yeah, you okay. know, like it's like 15 minutes to downtown. Are you originally from the West Coast? No, no. Okay. I'm uh, originally from the like just a little south of Boston, so the East Coast. Okay, okay. So what yep. if that's the case? Then what's the comic scene like in your area? Then was it like one of the reasons you wanted to move out there, or? Oh you know? no, 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 nothing like that. Uh, you know, I, I've always had like you know a job, job, and uh, <laughs> you know went to college and got my degree and worked in marketing for many, many years. Uh, and like nine years ago, I got a job offer in this Seattle area. I was living in DC at the time. And my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, her family is from Seattle. She grew up here. So when we were offered an opportunity to come back to her hometown, you know, all expenses paid to move and stuff like that, it made sense. It made sense. So that's what brought me across the country. Right on. And what's the comic scene like in in your area? Like, do you have a a go-to comic shop? 
I do have a couple, uh, actually, although uh, I have to drive a little further south to get to some good ones. Um, Tacoma has a pair of shops that I personally like shopping at. One is called Atomic Comics. One is called Stargazer. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they sort of uh, each specialize in maybe a little more mainstream and a little more indie, but they're both really nice and clean, super friendly, knowledgeable staff, like really, really good shops. So th- those are the ones I shop at these days. Yeah. I'm curious, as someone who is putting out videos every week, if not, you know, uh, sometimes double a week, what is your pull list looking like? Like, how many titles <laughs> would you say is on your pull list? Um, I would, well, I happen to have, like, this week's, I would say maybe eight to nine comics a week. Okay. That's, that's a... For, that's like, a, sort of floppies. And then okay. I might also be picking up maybe one to two back issues, maybe one to two manga or one to two trades on top of nice. that sometimes like on the, like the high end of what i do yeah yeah um, that's modest yeah i don't think i get that that much but sometimes when i pick a topic that's when i'm getting sort of a back issue or a trade to sort of like um refamiliarize myself with stuff when i moved across the country just to be clear i sold off like almost all my then collection about 30 long boxes Wow. And, um, so sometimes like that's stuff I still remember in my head, but like to refer to it for a video, I might need to like, you know, um, get it digitally or get a trade paperback sometimes. So sometimes I'm sort of refilling, uh, holes in my, my modest now collection. <laughs> so you've got your, your first comic cover ever coming out via Dynamite Entertainment, it being on the cover of Vampirella Year One, issue six, which is currently being written by Christopher Priest mm. and art yep. by, uh, is it Ergon uh, Gundes? You got it. And I understand uh, this particular issue actually comes out, it'll actually be out by the same time that this uh, episode comes out. But of course, your cover will, you know, um, will come out much later. Well, it comes out like around June, I think. Okay, okay. so not too far at all. All right, good stuff. No, it's going to be fulfilled pretty fast. Right on. Chris, do you mind telling us how you got the opportunity to work with Dynamite, like how that came up? Uh, their president, uh, Nick Barucci, super, super nice guy. Uh, he started dropping in on some of my live streams and oh, was cool. very, very kind, uh, said that he watched my show and, uh, you know, uh, we struck up a conversation, uh, here and there. And one day he was like, Hey, I've got an idea. I, let, let's just see what kind of crossover appeal there might be. Let's see if your audience would, you know, uh, follow you doing something fun with us just a little project uh, and you know so i was like absolutely that sounds like a great time Let, let's do it uh so if i was going to create a cover i was like well the show's called comic tropes i sort of started by talking about more of the recurring elements and 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 stuff and that's what what the the show was named then i think it's sort of over the years evolved to just be you know whatever an kind of analysis about comics but if i was going to do a cover Let's like fill it up with all the tropes I can think of, you know, death and homages and sexy women and guest stars and gorillas. Of course, gorillas. You know, what's funny is my wife is in, uh, <laughs> she's in, her bachelor's is in art history. And uh, I showed her the cover and I was like, well, babe, uh, what do you, what do you think of this? This is pretty sweet. And she's like, oh, wow, that's really good, man. And he even referenced, I think it's, she said La Pieta. And I was like, he made a video about that. Like, I was like, are you kidding me? She's like. Yeah. Do you know who you married? I'm like, my bad, girl. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's true. That's true. Um, you know, uh, it's an homage, and and I was specifically influenced by the versions uh, that have been drawn by, like, John Byrne in an issue of X-Men and oh, George sure. Perez in Crisis on Infinite Earths. Come on, yeah. But, yes, like, the pose and the idea is is a trope in comics. It goes back to uh, being influenced by Michelangelo's La Pieta statue. So, um, yeah, I, I did sort of a, a live stream on it once, just sort of going through some really famous uh, covers. Uh, another famous one people might remember is like the death of Captain Marvel. That That's a very, oh, yeah. very close uh, representation of the pose. For sure. What does it feel like to work on a legacy character like Vampirella? And also, how long before you start cosplaying as Forey Ackerman? <laughs> I don't. Do I look like him? I don't really. Not know. at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I. I. I feel like I, I'm just such a generic white guy. But there's like you know, <laughs> you, you, you add the glasses and the beard and like a little bit more weight, and there's not that many guys I can cosplay as uh, without like culturally appropriating something. Mm. Uh, so that's not good. Uh, <laughs> no, 
there there is a little bit of pressure guys there is you know not just like that it's vampirella but honestly just anything that's sort of mainstream in general because like i've done some comics but they're more like educational comics and certainly lots of self-published more indie stuff uh there's there's very little pressure there but you want this campaign to be successful i want this to potentially show that there's room for podcasts and youtubers that talk about comics to have opportunities to collaborate here and there on a fun project yeah you know we have to maintain like at arm's length sometimes the stuff that we're reviewing and stuff like that but that doesn't mean that we can't have friendly relationships with some of these people and i sure. want it to do well so that it's like I, 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 that's all self-imposed, but yeah, I've put some pressure on myself that I want this to be successful so that there's potential other opportunities for other people. Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Shortbox store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, but they won't last long and once they're gone they are gone and then i mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material none of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear and the hats look even better in person so wear your support for the short box nation proudly knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it get to the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can and don't forget to use that discount code Yo, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show. Yeah, and I think that's what made me most excited about, you know, reaching out and, you know, getting you on the show is that they could have easily just, you know, paired you with an artist to bring your, your vision to life and slapped your name on it. But the fact that they, you know, let you get really hands on with the product itself, I thought was a really cool opportunity. And like you said, it's, um, it's you know, if, yeah, if this goes well, like um, the doors it could open for, you know, other aspiring, you know, artists that also have like, you know, the, a podcast, YouTube, whatever it may be, like that side hustle that's a little outside of comics, but still related. Um, yeah, I yeah. think it's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, last time I checked the campaign, I think it was just a little shy of like 12,000 and at, at 20,000 would be like sort of my internal metric of where it would be considered successful. That mm. that would be enough. Okay. Which I, I'll, and I'll also be honest, like I thought it would be a little easier to reach that at first because I've got a decent subscriber base. Yeah. What I wasn't factoring in is like when you do a campaign like this, a crowdfunding campaign, Putting that news out there, that information out there through your social platforms, uh, how much it gets choked by the various platforms like no, like Twitter, Instagram, hmm. it doesn't matter like what, where I'm posting, even YouTube. They don't love links going outside of that platform. So that like really, really gets suppressed. And I'm, you know, that's why I'd love to come on a show like this and actually talk about it because then I'm actually reaching an audience that might be motivated to take a look. Just posting about it. It's like something where I'm only like, it's, it's trickling in how many people get to see that. Sure. It's tricky. You are speaking to the choir, like, to your point. Yeah. And for anyone that's listening that, you know, uh, might not know about like the behind the scenes stuff when it comes to opportunities like this from a, a creator side, the minute you start incorporating a, a call to action, you know, for something like, hey, you know, subscribe to my Patreon or check out this link that where I did, you know, whatever. Anything that takes the the user from its native platform, anything that forces them off Twitter or whatever, it, like you said, the algorithms hate that shit, yeah. right? Like it buries They're it. Like and Sarah Connor, makes... <laughs> boom, you're done. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. And I think that's what I, what I love about the medium of, of podcasting is that it's not um, contingent on the algorithms, right? Once you start building a fan base, you don't have to worry about it showing up to someone's feed or whatnot. So um, oh, yeah. I, I say all that to say the original goal was, was a very modest, uh, what was it, a modest 1000 I think, dollars, right? Yeah, we just put it at 1000 I think that that was mainly just so that we were sure we just quickly crossed a, a minimum 
where you guys are at a thousand and a hundred ninety four percent over the original goal, which I think is fucking awesome to see like that turnout and that support. Usually a campaign will sort of like start really strong. Mm -hmm. taper off and you might get like a big burst on like the last day maybe the last two days what we sort of saw instead was like it did start off strong and then it like was very very consistently steady right up to what was going to be the end so we've decided like okay clearly people are discovering this a little later they're not like and and so we extended it. I think it's going to go from like today, the twenty fourth is mm-hmm. when we're recording this. Uh, it'll go for like another eighteen days, maybe something like that, like a little over two weeks. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. It's got eighteen days left on the day we're recording. But by the time this episode comes out, people will still have a little bit, just under two weeks to um to fund the Perfect. campaign and sign up for rewards. Um, speaking of rewards, man, I, I'm, I'm loving the, the variety of rewards. You know, obviously you've got your cover available. You got different versions of the cover, black and white. You can get, you know, a a virgin cover, but then you start getting into some, uh, I'm assuming what like dynamite is kind of pitching in like a six foot, uh, door poster of Vampirella based on the iconic. There's nothing wrong with that. Not at all. Because I have honestly been looking to buy this art of Jose Gonzalez hardcover book for years. And I'm like. This might be, Buddy, why are you sleeping this is on my that, my opportunity. Man. Yeah. I think they've got it at a very fair price, and their shipping is, is reasonable as long as you're in the U.S. I will admit Indiegogo does not make it super friendly outside of the U.S., unfortunately. That's something I'll think about if I do another campaign in the future. If you're a Comic Tropes viewer and you want to get like some merchandise that's Comic Tropes-based, once you order the cover, there are add-ons. You could get like a, a plush of my mascot or an enamel pin that's pretty nice. But Dynamite is running the campaign itself. I did the art and it falls on, you know, like the creative person to do the the promotion, the marketing, the hustle. Right. Uh, but like, yeah, the, that that's all them, like adding various related Vampirella stuff and Dynamite books that, that may be of interest to people um, checking this out. It's some awesome additional rewards. They got a badass Vampirella statue, a cool ass bus. It's a lot of awesome stuff that I think people would really enjoy. Yeah, even if you aren't so. say a Vampirella quote unquote fan, there is a lot here to dive into. There's a lot of really like like Chris was talking about, there is a legacy of really good art and talent behind this character that y- you can get a piece of essentially if you decide to support. So, I mean, I think it's a good idea. Like hopefully yeah, uh, people get a kick out of the artwork that I've done here and think that that's fun. One nice thing is this is on a comic called Vampirella Year One, written by Christopher Priest. So if you haven't read Vampirella before, while this is issue six, it's still an overall good jumping on point to understand her origin. And if you have, you know, this is a six issue series. So it is giving additional context to like her supporting cast, her her origins, her her who she is. So it's, it, it's pretty good in that regard. If you're already a Vampirella fan. Well said, well said. And once again, like I said, listeners, uh, you'll have just under two weeks to go out and support the campaign. Highly recommend it. Help our guy Chris out. Come on, jump um, on it. Yeah. There'll be links. Uh, I made it easy for you too. All right. I included a link to the campaign in the show notes. So check that out. Chris, if you don't mind, we've got some questions uh, in regards to comic tropes. How dare you? I'm only here <laughs> to sell. I want to see both of you. Show me like on your phones that you've ordered. Don't hey, don't tempt me with a good time, buddy. I'll show you. Yeah, we'll pull it I'm up. just kidding around, but uh, yeah, let's talk about anything you guys want to. That's right. funny, man. Well, let's go ahead and you know help the uninitiated out. Let's assume like you know there might be someone tuning in that has no idea what comic tropes is. I mentioned in the beginning. It's you know it's, it's dedicated to studying the tropes in comics, and you provide history lessons on various comic topics. But uh, take us back to the beginning. What was the catalyst for launching the YouTube channel? Yeah, what was the catalyst Mm -hmm. for launching the YouTube channel? Oh, totally fair question. Uh, Basically, I just needed a project because the company that I'd moved across the country here to, to work at, you know, had a good three years there. Massive company, though. They did some restructuring. I got downsized out of a job. Now, I didn't know a whole lot of people here in the Pacific Northwest, and I knew it was likely that it was going to take me a little while until I found my next job, but I'm a, I'm kind of a workaholic. I really like to be busy, and I decided this was an excellent time to start a project that would keep me busy and what would be fun for me. I, I'm, there's nothing I'm more passionate about than comic books, so I just decided it was, it was, that was an easy time to pull the trigger. That's what it was, just to fill the time. 
Do you remember your first like exposure to like comics, or, or what was the moment that made you a, a fan? Like, what's your earliest comic yeah. book memory? There, there, there would be like sort of two things there because you know, like my earliest exposure was not necessarily when I became a fan. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, I know that growing up, I had a few comic books. I know that I had a Smurfs comic. I know I had <laughs> a Winnie the Pooh comic. And I know I had a random issue of The Flash where he went up against Gorilla Grodd. Nice. And I liked those, but none of them were like a huge impression. Like they were just sort of along with my children's books at the time, you know, whatever, like, you know, what's his name? Wikipedia Brown or something? No, it wouldn't have been Encyclopedia Wikipedia. Encyclopedia Brown. Encyclopedia Brown. Oh, I'm there I'm with updating you, it. That's the, I just remembered that that's the screen name of one of the guys on the uh, Mr. Sunday movie. So I literally, uh, I'm bad at names. I'm waiting on the Netflix updated Encyclopedia Brown series called Wikipedia Brown now. That sounds awesome. Well, I think those Aussies took it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, there's somebody with that name. That's a good, uh, uh, sorry, Mason. I, I, anyway, um, so so I had those, but I remember the, the time when I really got into them was, this is still super young Chris, and uh, I, but I had a paper route. This is probably like right around like fifth grade for me. And I would sometimes stop at this convenience store that was at the end of my paper route and maybe get like a, a candy bar or something with this money that I'm collecting. And then one day I saw a spinner rack of comics uh, and they had a Transformers comic. Now, now young Chris really liked Transformers. And I was like, oh my God, there's more Transformers than just the cartoon. <laughs> so I picked that up and, and that was vi- that was very eye-opening to me. And because that convenience store was so close... Like the next week, I went to see if there was more. I didn't know the schedule that they came out on or anything like that. I, I saw a G.I. Joe comic. And when I read that, I have to admit, the G.I. Joe comic was much, much better. It it it, it had like good art and, and a great writer, Larry Hama. No matter whether you're into G.I. Joe or not, it was, it was it, and, and still is like a legit good comic. Uh, so I started getting that for like a couple weeks and pretty soon I was like, well, I just crave more. And, uh, <laughs> I think that the first superhero I picked up at the time was the first issue of Craven's last hunt in Spider-Man. Wow. Uh, some artwork by Mike Zek. Uh, that made a big impression on me. Um, so that was, that was when I started like really getting excited about comics. It all spread very quickly from there. I totally relate to that. Um, when I was a kid, my dad was stationed in San Diego. He was in the Navy. And uh, I had a slew of like random ass comics just like that, where it was, I had an ALF comic. Oh, and I remember I, the ALF comic. Yeah. And I was just like, this is funny, man. I was like, okay, this is this what comic books are? That's, that's cool. And then we moved and there was a, my, a comic book store and my mom took me and I bought an X-Men classic, you know, the reprints of the old issues they started releasing in the 90s. Absolutely. And, and I was like, what? This is comic books? Are you kidding me? There's so much like soap opera and there's like, there's like aliens and who's this girl that can walk through stuff? And why is this dude made of steel punching dragons? I don't understand. You know, it's like, I, I, I get it. It's funny, man. Well, within a year of like reading the comics off the spinner rack, I was lucky. My mom was kind of supportive. I was like, you know, I'm starting at something like issue 27 of Transformers. Like, how do I get the other ones? And she looked in, you know, there was no internet, just to be clear. Like, I'm I'm old. And uh, so she looked in the yellow pages and found a local, local-ish comic book store and drove me to it so that I could discover back issues. And that's when awesome. I quickly discovered black and white books too like ninja turtles and usagi ojimbo and yeah so that would have been like mid 80s just a little before like their uh their cartoon came out it was it was it was eye-opening it was really exciting that's when i became a fan so fast the hyper fast forward to the what is it uh it'd be 20 what 15 2016 you decide to start your your youtube channel because you wanted to fill in time you you said you know you're someone that likes to stay busy yeah. So what made you pick YouTube as a platform and, and why comics, it, specifically comic tropes, which I think is a very interesting um, topic to cover? Mm, kind of you'd ask. So basically uh, YouTube, because uh, up until then, I already had been like doing just a traditional podcast with some friends for about seven years. And I was just ready to do something that was a little bit like, but that was about like um, genre TV type shows and stuff, you know sci-fi and fantasy and stuff and that was fun and it did well but i was ready to sort of like just do my own thing a little bit more at the time and 
I thought that because I'm talking about a visual medium, YouTube made a little more sense. Plus, I, it looked like it would be easier to monetize. So, like, those were some of the decisions. Like, and it, and it took a while to monetize, but that wasn't the main goal. It was just like there's the potential for that, and it's not hard. It wasn't a hard hurdle to cross. So that's sort of why I decided to do it on um, on YouTube and do it, you know, in the way I did. Oh, and I called it. Sorry, I, I almost forgot. You said, why did I call it Comic Tropes? And I'll be honest, the first episodes you see, I don't really have a script or anything. I'm literally just sort of grabbing a comic and sort of riffing on it, like looking at the recurring elements. That was all. I I, I didn't have a big plan yet because I also didn't know if this would grow. Um, so I didn't come up with the show name until I finished that first episode. I was talking about Chris Claremont's like recurring dialogue and plot type ideas. So I called it comic tropes might not make as much sense now. Cause I think like my show eventually sort of grew to just be broader, um, analysis and, but you know, whatever, that's how it started. Did you, could you, could you have ever foreseen the future of your comic book footprint where we are now? Probably not when I first started it, to be honest, it was just a project meant to keep me busy and like a topic that keeps me entertained. And then somewhere, you know, like when, you know, YouTube sends me like a silver play button because I crossed 100,000 subscribers, all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, maybe this could grow. Maybe, maybe, maybe someday I could like, you know, make, make a living doing this. And I can't, and I wouldn't say I quite can yet, maybe with a few different changes, but I'm, I'm just really s sort of conservative about how, how I'm super cautious about like, you know, just leaving a job behind. So I you have get it, a part-time job now. The struggle is real. We understand. <laughs> yeah. You're talking to the right dudes that yeah. are like, uh, we get this that. is a guaranteed check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't blame you at all. When would you say was your, uh, was there an interview or, or maybe a convention or something like a moment that made you feel confident that you were on the right path in regards to like among like the comic book community and like the, the, your, the comic creators that you looked up to it was like a moment of like, oh, damn, they're seeing me. You know, I've got a spotlight on me in the right, you know, in the right way. Once I crossed 5000 subscribers, it started picking up pretty significantly and, and regularly. And, um, you know, like basically somewhere around like, I'll say 2018 going to something like New York Comic Con. That was like just before the pandemic. And I got recognized a lot. And I was like, oh, like, I didn't expect that. I just sincerely. And yeah, I, I it's not like I can walk into a comic book store and definitely get recognized. But if I go to a convention, I get stopped a good amount by people saying that they watch the show or asking for a picture. And, and that's really flattering. You know, it's kind of fun to have like this safe environment where you get to be a little bit of a celebrity That's but like cool. outside of that you're just yourself it's kind of nice and speaking of, of conventions and you know celebrities in the world of comic books you've definitely interviewed your fair share of like you know people that we would deem celebrities in this comic space i'm talking like comic creators like scott snyder you've interviewed daniel warren johnson todd mcfarlane and you know the list goes on do you have a favorite interaction with a, with a creator Oh, favorite. Um, I mean, they're all a blast. I love doing interviews. I don't, I, I don't do them too often because also YouTube doesn't like really reward those. Like for whatever reason, it just doesn't love the interviews as much as the edited episodes. So I know that I'm going to like take a hit in viewers. So I only do them when I'm kind of excited to talk to somebody. Um, so they're all fun. I will say that like, I told you guys that an early comic that got me excited about comics was G.I. Joe. So getting to talk to Larry Hama, the the writer and really like creator of all the important characters there, um, that was a big deal for me. Also, he's this guy that has been in comics long enough that, you know, he apprenticed with Wally Wood and he sort of knows that previous generation of creators that aren't really here with us anymore. So getting to to pick his brain and learn you know, some of his story and, and, and some of the people that he learned from like Bernie Krigstein, that, that, that was oh, really, wow. that meant a lot to me on a personal level. Cause I was a fan of Larry and he has this connection to people that we can't talk to anymore. So that meant a lot to me. That, that one was special to me. That's cool. With six plus years of hosting the channel and you know, the various topics that you've deep, I mean, your deep dives are, are, are great, man. Like you leave really no stone unturned. And I've walked away plenty of times having learned a lot. 
Is there like any video that maybe resonated with you in the sense of like learning something just brand new or having like a light bulb moment of like, wow, that really changes the way I view comics. Like, do you have a video or a topic that, that, that has done that? I would say a bunch of them, to be honest, Botter, just because there's a bunch of like trivia that's just like bubbling around in my head at any given time. But when I decide to do more or less a deep dive on a creator and, and try to look at what makes their technique a little unique or special, something like that, I also go like, well, I don't, it would take too many weeks to do an hour and a half episode, which I easily could about pretty much any of them. I, I, I want to keep it to somewhere between 15 to 25 minutes. So I have to sort of like hone in a little bit more on like an angle, just like one angle that I can like, and, and then like, you know, if there's stuff left over, maybe I'll revisit that creator at some point. Um, and, and I think I always end up learning something because I always try to go beyond what my initial thoughts are and start pulling any um, interviews that they've done yeah. in like magazines or online and, and, and try to like familiarize myself with what they've already talked about and if they've already interpreted some of this stuff. Um, I don't want to ignore that. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, but that's that's my process. And I usually do because I'm reading those interviews. I usually do learn a little something new there. If you can recall, what's the last piece of trivia that you were just like, holy shit, I didn't even know that. I'm going to keep that one in the pocket, you know? Okay. Uh, ooh. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah, I'm asking because I, I need one for next time I'm at a convention surrounded oh. by like continents, right? Help me out, Chris. Yeah, I'm sort of trying, like, I'll, I'll be honest, as soon as I finish an episode, it's a little bit out of sight, out of mind, because I'm always working on several moving forward. And I'm, so I'm trying to think if there's anything interesting that I've come across there. Well, while you're thinking about it, okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah, let, feel you, free to interrupt yeah. us when you think of it. Yeah, just just okay. Chime in when you get something. I gotta ask because you were talking about being a workaholic, and yeah, I can I can understand that. And the cool thing about your channel is how you're really transparent with the with the fans and the community, man. What has Try kept me. you going through burnout? Because that's a very real thing too. Yeah, especially with 500 plus videos, like YouTube, yeah. right? Like. Editing yeah. audio for podcasting is, it's, it's time consuming, but it ain't video, right? It's not exactly <laughs> video per se. So, no. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. I remember, like I, like I said, I did like a, a po an audio podcast for seven years and I would edit that and like balancing the levels and cutting out the ums and the ahs whenever I could, uh, is time consuming. It is more time consuming doing a, specifically a comic book, uh, thing because, Say I was reviewing a movie or a TV show, I can drop in a clip for maybe five, 15 seconds or something while I'm talking. And that, that's, that's great. You know, like that, that, that's a good chunk of time each time you could do that. Uh, but when you are talking about a comic book, that, that's a static image. And I don't always want it to just be there. I want a little bit of visual interest. So, you know, you maybe are putting in sometimes a background that's moving, or maybe you're just doing a, a small pan or, or uh, zooming in a little. You want like a, a couple transitions. And it's very time consuming. It's very time consuming. So like most of the time for my videos, it, it, it's the editing that takes the most time. What kept you going through burnout? Just understanding myself better as I got older and realizing that I was sort of facing that burnout, um, trying to tell like my my viewers where I'm at and and being willing as I got like a little more established to every once in a while, yeah, take that week extra week to produce it so that it's a little better and it's not like, you know, half assed. And sometimes giving myself episodes that are easier in between the bigger ones. Like if I find a weird golden age character to review. <laughs> Those are really fun and not as hard because it's usually like, you know, a six page story or something. And I'm just like reacting to almost every panel and I'm like just sort of riffing on it and joking around. Those are fun for me and a lot easier. So sometimes you, you just give yourself something like that in between. Hmm. I'm gonna hop on uh, uh, C's question here because he, he made a really good point that you are very open and honest with your with your community and one thing I, I highly respect is your honesty about, like, you know, your mental health and just, you know, the grind of, yeah. of it all. And Butter's like, um, it's something I could never do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and and I, I, it definitely speaks to me, right? As someone who's been podcasting this long and I'll have my, yeah. my bouts of burnout and doubt and, you know, all this stuff here. Um, I, I was curious, like, how, how has comics... Uh, 
I'm, I want to say saved you, but that, that sounds so dramatic. But how has like comics and, and the community you've built, like how has that helped you in your journey of like, you know, mental health and things like that? Well, it does help. Uh, you know, storytelling can sometimes get me out of my own head. You know, sometimes hmm. comics can be an escape and that's valid. Sometimes I do like reading something a little deeper, but that still stimulates a different part of my brain than just focusing too much on my own situation. Uh, so, so comics are good in that regard. Um, analyzing them, uh, takes, you know, some mental energy and, and, and takes that a, a, off of like focusing on whatever's bothering me. Uh, and then there is a bit of a social aspect to either people reacting to whatever I put out or doing my live streams where I, you know, I, I do a weekly live stream for two hours and I, and I'm interacting with the audience the whole time. And that's a very fun social experience for me. That, that definitely keeps me excited about comics to, to get recommendations from other people or for someone to say like, wait, I didn't know that. And I'm like, oh, am I talking about something that not everybody knows? Let's dive into that a little bit more. That's fun. You know, it's, it's fun to talk about what you know, or talk about yourself. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Botter, he knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would just say that, like, you know, doing so something um, analytical or something creative, like, you know, just I like to draw as well, are mm. both things that can, like, just sort of, like, keep you busy and get you a little bit out of your own headspace sometimes. Um, you know, and, and, and you just have to know, like, yourself, which you know yourself as you get older. And I know that, you know, it's important for me personally, like, being on a certain medication – helps me not dwell on things. It doesn't like change exactly how I think, but it, it keeps me from dwelling on the bad things. Um, but also eating healthy, exercising and socializing, those three things like you really can't ignore. Like those all really do help. And and those don't come easy to me. I do think of myself as an introvert, but I force myself to do those things to to try to take care of myself. Well, well definitely appreciated, man. Uh, I've always wanted to visit Japan. And oh, sure. And I, I've I've been wondering, have you ever thought about doing, uh, you know, comic book characters based off your cats the way Junji Ito does? <laughs> talk about we'll, a we'll, segue. We'll talk about can that I, later. We'll talk about I, that later. Can we'll I say that segue? We'll talk about it later. Hell of look, a segue. Look, look, look. No, <laughs> all kidding aside, though, I, I got to know, where did your love of uh, Japanese comic books, uh, manga, um, all that stuff come from? And how does it inform your work? Uh, well, to me, it's all comics, you know, yep. it's all still sequential storytelling, uh, you know, basically pen and ink or, you know, maybe digital, but you, you get my, my, uh, impression to me, uh, there might be some cultural cues in the storytelling, but overall to me, it's all comics. I mean, you're going to find some of those same differences. I like to read, um, you know, Belgian and, and British comics and, and things like that. I like to read comics from other countries to, to compare and contrast. There's a lot of similarities is all I'll say. Um, and then I also even looking at like old stuff or independent stuff compared to modern mainstream stuff can have just as big differences as just like looking at, you know, like the latest issue of Batman versus the latest issue of, I don't know, um, Chainsaw Man, you know, like, the, the, <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, to me, you know, the, the thing I like about manga over here is it's very bingeable, very easy to like, you know, like they, they tend to bring it over after it's been going for a little while and they tend to bring over a lot of the series that are going to appeal to us a little bit more. Like, you know, once you go over to Japan, you realize there's a lot more comics hmm. and most of those don't get brought over here because you know, there's probably cultural differences where, where they they don't think that there's the audience for like, you know, certain sure. romance comics or, or certain like, you know, workplace or sports comics. Um, so the things they bring over like are, are likely to have broad appeal with sci-fi or something like that or supernatural. And, um, it's just very bingeable. So, so that's really fun to get into. Yeah. I just started reading Chainsaw Man and that shit is bonkers. I love it so much. It's a lot darker than I expected it to be. No I thought kidding. it was going to be like sort of tongue in cheek and funny and stuff. And very quickly you're like, wow, this is actually a really dark story. <laughs> True story. With people like betraying each other and like treating each other <laughs> like, kind of bad. I just want to go ahead and compliment. I'm smiling because I, I want to compliment C on one hell of a segue. He knew I wanted to pick your brain about manga in Japan and talk about a way to insert it and, and get us on this topic. Chris, I wanted to say that uh, 
one of the uh, most, I guess, conscious exposures I had to like getting you on my radar. I don't know if you did a video or you just like gave a shout out to um, this manga that I I loved and I felt like no one else had heard about it or read it was Pluto. You constantly kind of oh bring my up god, Pluto that was like and... like something like my third or fourth episode ever. Okay, all right, Th- so it must have been like that early. So I guess nice flex, Naoki nice Arisawa. flex. Okay, Vader. Okay, so, we get it. So I love that you champion both well known manga that could be found in Shonen Jump, but also yeah. you know some stuff that might require you to do your homework. And um, I also follow you on Twitter, and I think you're a good Twitter follow. You always pose, like, really good questions. It always gets, like, good engagement and good responses. I think you recently had one about, like, Marvel manga, and I, I responded oh, to yeah, it I sharing think I something. And recently, last week, there was kind of that thread going around about, like, you know, ma- that, that, that picture of the, the manga bookshelf at, I think it was a Barnes & Nobles. It was over flooded so. with manga and someone was, you know, whatever the tweet was angry, you know, it's internet anger, right? Like, look how much manga's <laughs> on this, you know, bookshelf being pushed by books a million. And look at the American comics. It was like this little sliver or they something like that. Gaps. <laughs> I know, you know, what I enjoy about you is that you don't partake in any, like, you know, uh, hot takes and, right. you know, needless sensationalism. But I am curious, what is your take on, like, this kind of played out argument of, of like, you know, manga outselling, you know, American comics and it being the death of American comics and all that bullshit that you hear. Like, you got an official take? You, you like uh, to share? I'm not worried about it putting American comics out of business. I'll say that. Like, I, like, there's a lot of manga that I adore. It's some yeah. great stuff. To me, it's all comics. And if that's what get that's somebody's entry point into comics. And even if they just stay with that, that's fine. You know, like that is still part of our industry too you know like they're publishing it here they're distributing it here they're selling it in our stores here that's fine with me um is it is like you know something like chainsaw man outselling batman um maybe yeah i'd have to double check the numbers it probably does uh at the same time they're 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 really just there's so much to go into in terms of the presentation um you know i'm not worried about american comics going anywhere because first of all just suppose like devil's advocate marvel dc image dark horse idw they all went out of business tomorrow right they they just all of a sudden whoops they all made a big mistake and they all went out of business um there's still going to be people that want to create indie comics or web comics you know there's still going to be it's it's a low barrier to entry if you can be creative and write and draw like you can create something and, and, and self-publish it theoretically. So that's not necessarily going away. And then when you look at the bigger stuff, like Marvel and DC's characters also aren't going to go anywhere. I mean, that j- just to keep the intellectual property alive for making into movies and toys and stuff, they're they're going to like want to put it in other things. Like, so I'm just not worried about that. You know, like if they were losing money, like just nothing but losing money, they'd make some changes. I don't think that American comics are especially motivated to sell much better, unfortunately. Because they could. I really think that they could. I think with a few changes to both distribution and presentation, there is, there's very little that would prevent Marvel from, say, gathering together a classic run will say Daredevil Born Again, or even something like, you know, more modern, like, uh, I don't know, the, the the most recent Flash run by Jeremy Adams, whatever it could be, like, you know, a, a solid run that, that fans love. You could put that in black and white, put that in like a Tonkabon format and sell it for about the same price. And I bet it would appeal to a lot of new readers, you know, because they could binge one whole story. Um, And it would like be very cost effective. Marvel and DC don't have a lot of like financial incentive to try the new things. They don't care enough. And I, and I'm not trying to be mean to them. They just, they literally just don't, they, you know, they could bring over, you know, the manga versions of Moon Knight and Spider-Man and Deadpool and stuff that they, that they've done over the years. And they just don't have a lot of motivation uh, to bother. That is a bucket list manga right there. The 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 Marvel the Moon Knight manga that has yet to be translated or released would be oh yeah awesome yeah I'm glad to, I'm glad I got to hear your opinion on that yeah. uh, Chris thank you one more question on the topic of manga you know I got to hear you say that Pluto's among your favorite what are what are some of your other favorite manga picks and do you have any recommendations for anyone that's been hesitant into getting into manga that loves American comics 
Oh, absolutely. I'd recommend plenty of it. And I would usually tailor my recommendation to what I know that person likes. You know, if they're going to tell me that they like, you know, that they're not into superheroes or supernatural and stuff, I go, well, that's okay. You know, like maybe um, another book by Naoki Urasawa, like, like uh, Monster or something like that. You know, that, that is nothing supernatural. It's about like, you know, a doctor on the run that's been framed for like murder or there's, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of, there's so many different genres there. Like Slam Dunk is one I'm really enjoying right now. And I'm not a huge basketball fan, but Slam Dunk is a really entertaining, super fast paced manga. And it's really funny too. Mm. Uh, so, so, you know, there's a million places I could recommend these days. Some of the ones I'm enjoying the most are like, you know, Spy Family. Berserk is sort of back. So I'm, I'm that, that's one I'm kind of passionate about. There, there's so many though, you know, there's so many, it's, it's hard to know where to start unless I know what somebody else likes, but there are classics, you know, Akira is a classic for a reason. It's a huge epic, but boy, that art is gorgeous. Just yeah, gorgeous. Chris, how do you go about, uh, it sounds like I'm, I'm getting a little bit of a, a preview, but I, I want to hear it in your words. How do you go about recommending comics to people like, you know, whatever American comics specifically to people? Because I'll say the man to my left right here uh, introduced me to probably my go to way now, which is asking, like, you know, what's some of your favorite movies and figuring out like Definitely. a genre? Yeah. If somebody's like, I've never really read comics before. I've only like read one or two, but you know, tell me a little bit more about comics. I'm like, absolutely. Yeah. Like what books or, or movies do you like? Or, you know, tell me what media you like. And from there, you know, I could come up with a solid recommendation. You know, if it's like horror, cool. But if you tell me that you like a really specific like horror movie, I could probably think up off the top of my head, like, you know, a specific comic that might be really good that that's got some similar vibes or maybe you just like you know like um you know rom-coms or something i don't know like there, there's there's going to be something i can recommend but I, I yeah i definitely think that that's the way to do it is to i'm not just going to go mouse and watchmen are critically acclaimed you must start with those two comics you must and then you'll read dark knight returns like i don't know anything about batman you'll read it and like it uh, it's acclaimed <laughs> Chris, I'm gonna put you on the spot because you brought up if if someone names a horror uh, movie, you could probably give some recommendations. So you give him a horror title. Throw so, him a horror title. You know, you know, it's funny. I, he was talking. Uh, you you mentioned Washington, and I thought about Twin Peaks, and I was like, you know, oh. blood blood on the tracks is a manga that was suggested to me because I'm such a, a oh. Twin Peaks stan, and it's like, dude, this is like a psychological horror that you have to get into. So you. Uh, this is hard because I know Chris does enjoy horror films because I've seen some of the Inktober stuff, and I know That's for true, a fact do. you dig Jason. Uh, I especially, do, especially some of the more funnier, uh, I guess, entries into the franchise, such as Jason. Yeah. I, I call it Jason Takes Manhattan. You know, it's, <laughs> right. it's like the Muppets took Manhattan. Why not? You know, the man behind the mask. Um, I I don't know. I would say uh, okay, something like Insidious. That's something new, right? I'm I'm, like look, I'm in my 40s, okay. and I'm like, uh, what's? Uh, uh, you ask me what horror movie I like, I'm gonna be like, oh, dude, have you seen? No, that's okay. Uh, Society, <laughs> that's a badass <laughs> film. <laughs> All right, yeah. Well, let's run with Insidious. So, so, so you tell me Insidious, and and I and I think of like you know sort of supernatural haunting type stuff. So I would say that maybe Scott Snyder and Jock's Witches might be one, especially with okay. that getting adapted soon to Amazon. That that might be an entry point. I think Harrow yes. County might be like sort of a similar, like really good horror comic there. Um, and you know, if if I had a little bit of quiet time to just sit down, I'm I'm a very visual person, so I might like sort of write some notes to myself. I'd probably think of some other like appropriate ones off like sure. if I could do that. See, this guy's good. I know, he's good. This guy's good. good. He's good. He's good. All right, Chris, you you passed. I don't know why I was trying to check your nerd card. Obviously, I embarrassed myself on my show, but you did it. (laughs) No, but that's fun. Those are good ones. I think that's fun. And and, and I think that, like, you know, probably somebody out there listening, like, something popped in their head at the same time, and they're like, oh, why didn't Chris say that? And it's like, well, you know, maybe give me 20 minutes of quiet time. Maybe I would (laughs) have. I put him on the spot, folks, and and, and he passed the test. And I'm going to continue to put you on the spot because this is a question I love asking um, a, a lot of our guests, but specifically, God, do. specifically if they are a an artist themselves, and, and obviously you fit that um, you fit that role, Chris. And mm-hmm. I'm I'm curious to hear because you, you've tossed out a few names. I, I heard you mention John Byrne, of course George Perez, um, Alan you, Moore. Yeah, you mentioned Alan Moore and Larry Hama, of course. 
if you had to create a comic Mount Rushmore based on your favorite mm. comic artists or you know comic icons or people that you deem comic icons, who would be on that Mount Rushmore? Okay, that's that's a good challenge. Uh, probably Will Eisner. I think he's pretty oh, influential. Yeah. Uh, so I I, I I I would throw him up there. Uh, I'd want something modern and like Daniel Warren Johnson excites me like nobody else. Hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, even though we, we just talked about it, I'd also put like, you know, I think one of the greatest creators these days is Naoki Urasawa. He just, I, I just think he has excellent storytelling chops. So I'll put him up there. Uh, and like, oh, now, now, now it gets even harder. Cause there's like, all I can think of is like, you know, like all the people that I won't get to list that'll like, sort of like, like hurt me spiritually so this is like a very painful <laughs> question um maybe maybe somebody that excited me early on when i was getting into comics like mike zek uh who i think was like just really really exciting and, and rock solid uh yeah yeah i'll put him too but there's just so many now that i'm like not listing it it hurts it hurts that is a solid list man yeah, super cool. solid list we're gonna get you off the hot seat chris you know i want to talk about something that um a topic that is more so a bragging right for you, a very unique bragging right at that. Uh, you have okay. a very rare bragging right among comic fans and, and comic creators in that you were once a real-life superhero going by the moniker oh. of Omega. You participated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you're watching the video version, this is where Chris is like, uh, I think I got to wrap up, guys. He's yeah. like, oh, guys, no, look at the time. Okay. <laughs> look, you went by Omega. You participated in, in numerous patrols and art yeah. outreach missions as part of the Seattle, Washington-based Rain City superhero movement. What sticks out to you about that about that time? And what was the motivation to don a costume and, you know, fight the good fight? Well, uh, when I moved out here, uh, for that new job, I didn't hmm. really know anybody except I had interviewed Phoenix Jones and it, we'd stayed in touch because he knew I could draw. So he was always sort of getting me to come up with designs for stuff. So that's fair. <laughs> he's a, he's an entertaining guy. He's a little chaotic, uh, in his like organization of his life, but he was very entertaining. He's very charismatic. Chris, real quick, for the yeah. uninitiated, Phoenix Jones being the the the, the head he's of pretty the... much the premier like real life okay. superhero. If you Google real life superhero, Phoenix got a lot of publicity there, and I think some of that is because he really focused on trying to break up fights as compared to just sort of putting on a suit and walking around and like shaking hands or giving out homeless handouts. He he legit wanted to break up fights and solve crimes. Hmm. And he had a background. Um, he's a professional MMA fighter. So he's, um, he's definitely very capable. At the time that I moved out, not only did I know him, but I was in much better shape at the time. I'd been studying Krav Maga for about three years. I went to a personal trainer every day for like an hour. And then I had, during my lunch break, I was doing the insanity workout at work every, so I would work out for two hours a day and do like Krav Maga. It was, it was crazy. Like I was in much better shape at that point in my life. So I felt capable of like going out with him. And at first I just sort of went out more as like a guest and I don't know what to say. Like, I, I sort of started buying into the hype and, and drinking the Kool-Aid and going like, yeah, maybe we can like really inspire people by like wearing these outlandish costumes and doing good deeds and, you know, getting press. Like maybe the average person will will be kinder or something. I, I, I thought it was worth a try. And so I did that for about a year. I did that for like a year, dressing up in a a superhero suit like bulletproof jacket and stuff. And we would, you know, chase down drunk drivers and, uh, help people that were like, you know, getting in fights from when the bars closed, uh, helping people that got lost in crowds and stuff, uh, giving emergency aid for people that would like fall down or get hurt. And it was pretty, it was pretty wild. Honestly, it was pretty dramatic stuff. It was, it was legit. It was pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy. Definitely gotten a lot of fights and stuff. <laughs> Damn. Scrappy. Well, man, Chris Scrappy. is not to be fucked with, man. No. All right. I might run a successful comic YouTube channel, but you don't want these hands, okay? That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> I mean, I've put on weight, but I, I definitely feel capable in a fight. I, hmm. I, I'm i sincere. Like, yeah, I, I feel very capable. I, I uh, And you do it enough and your adrenaline doesn't get 
get up as much. So, so you're able to just make smart decisions, you know, like most fights are very, very quick. Um, but more of the stuff I was doing, to be honest, was I, some of these guys were looking for fights. You mm. could tell that they had a chip on their shoulder. There was one guy, I don't want to name names even, like even if using the superhero yeah, names, I might tell a comic someday and like sort of use placeholder names, but there was a guy that was always trying to bring around like knives. And we were like, no, you can't do that. We're walking around in masks. If a police officer sees like you with like, you know, a concealed weapon, we're all done. You can't do that. Like we, we knew what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do. Some of them would be really quick to pull a taser out. And I'd always be like, you don't need to do that. Like they didn't use it, but they'd pull it out and like aim it at someone. I'm like, put that shit away. What are you doing? <laughs> Um, you know, there were times where we threw fists, but like, I was, I was just not about like carrying weapons around or I would like, you know, I remember the, w one of the first nights I went out was like on, um, New Year's Eve. Okay. okay. Huge, tons and tons of people downtown partying and stuff. And there was a guy who only spoke Spanish and he couldn't find his girlfriend. Now I speak terrible Spanish, but I did go to college and have to get like, you know, <laughs> three semesters and got signed off. So I was able to communicate with him enough to find out what was going on. And I said, give me your number you're, and I'm going to keep my eye out because we're just walking around. And you know what? Like about an hour and a half later, I saw a girl in a subway that really matched the description. And I went inside and was able to talk to her and it was her and called, called the guy and, um, Got them reunited, and he'd already talked to the police, wow. but the police didn't find her. Like, uh, and I was really proud of myself that I did. Um, oh, that yeah. was just, you know, like uh, one little thing, like because it didn't all have to be fights. And when I talked to people like that, the other guys wouldn't really do this, but I'd take my mask off. I didn't really care about the secret identity aspect so much. I was, it was, it was a look, you know. But um, I wanted them to be able to see that I was like a real person, not like some weirdo. I don't know. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny there, not to reduce the, you know sincerity of this moment but yeah. when you were talking about that guy that was trying to bring weapons and you're like what are you uh, doing all i thought of was that episode of the tick where yeah. big shot is the guy and, and he's like he's like guns and superheroes don't mix friend seek professional <laughs> help and then he, he, he leaves big shot with arthur of all people and yeah. arthur's like are you gonna be okay and he's like dad why didn't you love me and he like just hugs him <laughs> <laughs> this is tears coming Cezanne. from his eyes. It's so good. I love the way says those rain works, man. That well, was awesome. I you look. I know. I know. Chris likes the tick as well. You know. I do. Yeah. Ben Edlund grew up in a, co a couple towns over from me. He's the guy that created the tick, and I got to like you know meet him several times when those first couple issues were coming out because he would do signings at the comic store I went to. Uh, NEC was who published it, so so that was nice. I got to meet him a bunch then. It was nice. It was inspiring. Oh yeah. Uh, well, speaking of inspiration, I was going to say, if you wanted to give, I guess, any one piece of advice to an aspiring uh, YouTuber, maybe that's listening right now, podcaster, or anybody, uh, based on something you wish you'd have known prior to starting your journey, what would it okay. be? Uh, be patient, have good thumbnails and good episode description, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And like legit, just like do some, do, do Google search to see like what words are trending and stuff like that. Uh, and, and find ways to work them in when you can have nice, clean thumbnails. Like li it sounds little, but like, honestly, like that's the stuff that catches people, uh, people's eye when you're scrolling through and can potentially help you with the algorithm. The other thing I'll let, I'd let people know is depends on what kind of a channel you want to do. Unfortunately, Google and YouTube kind of reward a negative word. Like if you say hmm. failure or worst, oh my God, that gets showed to so many more people. That's so depressing. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> it is a little depressing because I also don't want to like, I want to play the game a little bit, but I, I'm not going to put it in every episode. Like that would just right. be crazy. Like right. the worst reason to love this creator. <laughs> <laughs> it's like worst <laughs> podcast I've ever been on. It's like a picture of me and Potter like. No, well, I was thinking. I was thinking. The <laughs> next month, our listeners are going to notice the worst reasons why you should listen to this podcast. Podcast. The fails. worst interview with X, Y, Z. Botter. Jesus Christ! Yeah. You didn't have to take it to the extreme. I got you. But you got to know that, like, yeah, they'll they'll sort of like they sort of reward stuff like that. Not interesting always, but you know, my most pop or my most viewed video is one where I critiqued one of 
Jack Kirby's inkers that I didn't personally care about. I never expected that to blow up the way it did. And it's probably because I said something like, I don't remember the exact title anymore, but I think I had either worst or failure or something like that. Ruined? I think that that was the word. It, I was, used, ruined. it was ruined, yeah. Wow. Which I look back and I'm like, well, geez, if I knew it was going to be that popular, I might have been less harsh, honestly. That's not like what I wanted to be known for, but you can't right. like, I, I try to be very positive with my channel. I, there's so many good things to recommend, but I also like, even when I'm recommending something, I say like, here's something that I didn't love about it. I try to give a nuanced perspective on it. Sometimes I will look at stuff that I don't love. And I, cause you know, I, you gotta have some perspective, what's good, what's bad, but I don't focus on that too much. It's, it's a little too bad that that's the stuff that ends up being the most popular, a little too bad. That comes through, Chris, though. I, 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 I feel every time I watch your content, and I have an unbiased source in my wife who also sits on the couch, and while she's reading a novel, her eyes will dart up to the TV every time, and just, you know, listen and be like, huh, like that. It's, it's, That's the, the, the vibe you always give off is one of a positive vibe, and it's, and it's an environment, I, I feel, of learning, right? I never Thank feel you. like I'm tuning into some edgelord who's trying to be like, well, let me tell you guys, like what you, what you made in reference in the past, like it's acclaimed <laughs> like this, you know, it's like, yeah, no, it's like, no, it's comics. You know, that's why you should like it. Period. Dot. You know, it's, and it's on a mo comics. more like fundamental level. See, it's like, I, uh, I think storytelling in general is what helps us understand the human condition and relate to each other a little bit more. I think that, you know, like there's so many reasons to have differences with each other, but our arts can like unite us. You know, music is something like, you know, we could have such different politics or different cultural, you know, bring upbringings, but we might both like really just dig the same song. Cause that's just music and, and hopefully storytelling can, can help there too sometimes. Uh, or can at least give us like, Oh, okay. This person thinks that I thought that. And I didn't like, I've never talked to somebody that like, had that same viewpoint, but that, that makes me feel more connected to that person. There's a lot of positives to storytelling in general. I think it's very, very valuable. It doesn't it has, have to be a positive story. It just can connect us to each other. Look, Chris and I, you, you and I could talk about the, the uh, intricacies of Joseph Campbell for hours. If we, oh, yeah. But I feel like oh, Botter yeah. is, is chomping at the bit here. It's champing at the bit. Champing. <laughs> Damn it. Not Damn chomping. It. And I wanted to tie it back to uh, to Vampirella and, and the campaign and the whole reason you're here. What if you had to give someone uh, advice on, you know, launching a campaign or Indiegogo mm -hmm. or Kickstarter, whatever it may be, specifically like a comic one? Now, granted, you know, your campaign still has got a still has a couple of days left, so maybe this question is better saved for later. But it, being in the middle of it, like, what advice do you got? That that's an interesting question, Botter. Um... Fortunately, I've also, you know, supported some Kickstarter comics and, and I've had some friends run Kickstarter. So I've, I've seen a few things. Uh, this is my only campaign so far. I would say get people sort of, uh, aware of it before you even launch the campaign. You know, that hmm. could just be like launching a page saying coming soon with some details about it. Uh, it would be using whatever social networks you have as well as sucking up your ego and reaching out to people you're friendly with to say like you know are you comfortable giving this a plug um i don't like asking people for favors it makes me very uncomfortable but i do want this to be successful so you know i've reached out to to some creators like i'm like you know hey tom king like not that we know each other that well we've talked like once would you be willing to give this a retweet <laughs> and he's like sure nerd <laughs> 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 but he did retweet it and and like that's reaching a bunch of new people you know uh reaching out to you know shows that like yours and stuff like that i, I i'm not comfortable just saying like i want to plug this can i please use your platform i'm not comfortable but but honestly it is the kind of stuff that's going to help because we talked about it like you know if i post to something like twitter or youtube whatever it might be and post that link not not everybody that follows me is going to no. see it. Only a very a small community. percentage. Only a very yeah. small percentage gets to see that. But if I can talk about it on another platform that also hopefully has some new eyeballs or ears, 
mm-hmm. you know, that's going to do well. So, so I think it's like, you know, just sort of like getting over that hurdle and asking for help. Gotcha. Uh, see, I don't know if you um, heard any of that, but hopefully you heard the part where Chris put us in the same sentence as Tom King. You know? Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> No, Chris, that was a that was a fantastic response and some solid practical advice. So thank you for sharing that. And I want to let all of our listeners know once again, I'm gonna plug again, man. Uh Chris has got his first comic cover ever coming out through, through Dynamite, Dynamite Entertainment uh for Vampirella Year One, issue six. That campaign is live on Indiegogo for another couple of days. And you would be doing yourself a disservice not backing that project and, and helping such a solid champion of, of comic culture. Yeah, we're not uh, just waxing this car here, guys. This isn't a <laughs> this isn't just like a, oh, do my friend a favor. Honestly, this is like this is good quality stuff. You're Thank gonna be you. doing yourself a favor. You're gonna be help and in the process helping out one of the homies, man. Yeah, true, like, true. He's freaking one of the homies. And like, it's kind of history too. I mean, uh, a comic YouTuber with his own, you know, hand drawn comic cover is is like I said, knocking out goals. and knocking out all the tropes within oh, comic yeah, books. It's pretty is dope. pretty cool. It so is, is. I mean, get, get, what are you waiting for, guys? Honestly, like be a part of the street team. Represent. Yeah. I mean, come on now, Tom King, holla. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <It's> <laughs> All right, Chris, do you mind doing me a solid? We're really doing everyone tuning in right now a, a big favor and telling us what you got coming up next. What are you working on? Obviously, I'm going to have links to the Indiegogo campaign in the show notes so everyone listening can go ahead and click that link in and support your first comic project ever. But tell us what you got coming up on the YouTube channel. What can people expect from Comic Tropes next? Always have tons of upcoming videos. I think a lot of people know about comic tropes. Thank you for letting me plug the Vampirella cover on Indiegogo. Uh, the only other thing that, that like I'd love to plug is I have a second channel where I do a weekly live stream, Mondays, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. I talk for about two hours uh, recapping the comic book news and comics of the week. That all sounds awesome. Chris, thank you so much. This was a fantastic interview. Thank you for giving us your time. But I think we've talked your ear off enough. We're going to go ahead and let you enjoy the rest of your night and enjoy your weekend. But just know that you are always welcome back to the short box. You got, you got a place here on the show, right? Thanks again. I just want to say thanks, man, for everything you do, dude. Honestly. No, so sweet. Good time. And there you have it, Short Box Nation. That is the end of our show. Hopefully you enjoyed our conversation with Chris. Hopefully you're a believer now in comic tropes and you go ahead and subscribe to that awesome channel on YouTube. And most importantly, I hope you find it in your hearts to go ahead and support the Indiegogo campaign and help Chris out with his first comic project ever. It's going to be awesome. Speaking of support, if you enjoyed this episode, I mean, obviously you must have, you made it this far. You're hearing me do this, my outro pitch. Do me a favor. Go ahead and leave us a five-star rating review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you haven't already. Ratings and reviews are huge, huge help uh, to podcasts and helping us spread the word of the Short Box Nation. And if you really want to help, go ahead and send this episode. Share this episode with a friend that loves comics as much as we do. That would be awesome as well. Thanks in advance. Now, as far as next week, Ed should be back to the show. And I think Cesar is going to attempt to go for a back-to-back appearance. And he should, because next week is his topic. It's his kind of, it's his baby, all right? Next week, we're doing another installment of our Artist Spotlight series. Next week, we're dedicating the whole episode to Don Diego de la Vega himself. I'm talking about Zorro, because we're going to be exploring how pulp comics have influenced and continue to influence comic books and superheroes to this day. It's going to be an awesome episode. You won't want to miss that. That'll be next week. But if you can't wait that long, if you're impatient, if you're as impatient as I am and in a week, it sounds like forever, you'll want to go ahead and head over to our Patreon community at patreon.com slash the short box. We got a bunch of bonus episodes available, some, some interviews that haven't seen the light of day yet. So if you can't wait, if you want more content from us, head over to Patreon, join our community. It's a good time over there as well. In the meantime, I'm, I'm done talking, right? Let's wrap this thing up. Take care of yourselves. Go read your comic books and continue to make mine and yours short box. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.